Hello and welcome to Mother Earth's Sacred Sites, Portals to Spiritual Awakening and Finding Your Heart's Desire. I'm Peggy Moore and I'm your host for this summit. Our intention is to help people who are on a spiritual path find the connection between the energy of the earth, sacred sites, and the advancement of one's own spiritual path. Through the summit, I want you to discover how this ancient wisdom can guide you in your heart's desire to find your soul's mission. Then allow that energy, that energetic connection, to help you discern how to live to your highest potential. And with me today is Cater Brown, and we're going to talk about those journeys, about sacred sites, and about searching for and and opening to our own path. Cater is an internationally known ceremonialist, healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, he has devoted effective and unique, he has developed, I'm sorry, he's developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge and experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based treatment and professional training programs. Cater, welcome. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Thank you, Peggy. It's exciting to be here. Yeah. So we want to talk about spiritual journeys through uh, with the connection to sacred sites. Um, I see every trip I've made to a sacred site really as a little mini vision quest um, mm -hmm. because it, it takes me to a different place. It takes me to a, a new growth place. So tell me, tell me your vision on that and how you see um, our connection between our looking for our spiritual path and sacred sites. Um, well, sacred sites, I, I have to speak of what comes up in the immediate field of uh, awareness as you talk. And yes. uh, a number of my ancestors are maybe three of the four branches of my ancestors come from Ireland. And several years ago, um, I went to Ireland and went to a sacred site called Newgrange. Mm -hmm. And Newgrange is this, uh, as you, as you probably know, this ancient uh, burial chamber in which at the winter solstice, the light comes through this, this upper chamber and then travels down this pathway to the center central uh, room or chamber and lights up. And, um, and then inside that chamber, there are small alcoves and they have these big stone bowls in there. And so one of the stories is that this is the place where they would put the ashes of their ancestors in these great big bowls. Um, so definitely a, a touchstone sacred site for me that wants to be acknowledged in this moment. Um, and when I think about sacred sites and finding your passion, your purpose, um, you know, my work being with rites of passage in which one goes up on the mountain in a ceremony and creates or co-creates with nature and with spirit sacred site. Um, as one of my teachers uh, from a long time ago, Stephen Foster and Meredith Little, they would tell me that if you go anywhere in nature and sit there for long enough and notice the details of everything around you and let the details of everything and everyone around you notice you, that's, that place will become sacred um, in that exchange of acknowledgement. Um, it's a way of, uh, think of this, this way of truly belonging to a place in such a way that it becomes sacred is to uh, allow ourselves to be seen and to truly see, connect. 
um, whether it happens to be a, uh, a place by the river near our home or you know, one of these world sacred sites like New Grange or, or many, many other places around the planet where many people travel to and, and visit. Um, but I think of sacred sites as that which is a relationship more than a place. Mm -hmm. um, and to enter into relationship with a particular place opens up the sacred. Um, it's like when we, uh, when we approach the sacred in a, in a certain way of reverence, of attention and noticing and honoring, the sacred approaches us. And then there's this meeting that we encounter in that place uh, that many simply call the present moment. Um, that place where our awareness expands and our attention and energy expands. Um, so I think about that with sacred sites. When I think about the earth, um, I was when you when I do these interviews, I kind of track what pops up in my mind because um, mm -hmm. I have no idea where we're going. Um, and as you were talking about the earth and the energies of the earth. Um, I was reminded of uh, what I think of as the different faces of Earth. There's uh, Earth as an organizing planet and, and system of, of networking connections and interconnections that are uh, all, all designed to work together. And then there's uh, Gaia, the spirit of the Earth. Mm -hmm. or, um, and then there's... Uh, Earth as a transformational medicine. And I think this is uh, both Gaia, the spirit of Earth, and then Earth as Earth medicine, as transformational medicine. I think this is what's calling us during this particular time of the challenges that we're facing at this time on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the, the Earth medicine uh, is that which is... Um, connecting it's uh it's about connection to home to community to belonging the sense of belonging within our skin belonging to place um it's about uh um, composting you know and, and restoration yes um and so when i think of earth rituals that i've done or or supported other people and in, in held in a ritual space uh, to connect with the earth energies, um, you know, it teaches about um, grounding and compassion, that the earth's dreaming becomes our dreaming again. And, um, you know, and I know when th this uh, interview airs and, and some time from now, we ha will have been in this uh, period of the coronavirus for a number of weeks. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I think of the coronavirus, uh, I think of it as a teacher. And, uh, and as a teacher, um, not all teachers are comfortable or pleasant, but useful. Um, and the teaching that I continue to hear coming up with in this time is that of uh, connecting with Earth. Um, but not from this uh, human-centric or, or egocentric place of we're going to heal the earth. So many of people kind of get caught in that we need to heal the earth and we need to attend to the earth. And these things are true. Um, but we, we forget how small that we truly are and how the earth and these sacred sites assist us in healing. Mm -hmm. And so earth as a, a medicine of healing connection belonging place, compassion. Um, I think these are things that we're being called to attend to as we're slowing down in these times. So those are some initial thoughts that, that come to mind around earth and sacred sites. Yes, and you know, sacred sites, I mean, there, there are some from, from earth, um, you know, there are specific things that cause sacred sites to be built at the spot where they are, but there's a lot more uh, in the world that are sacred sites besides things that have been built there. And I know you see 
the the world with sacred sites that we create ourselves or that we become a part of. Talk talk about that for a bit. Yeah, certainly the planet has energetic ley lines that that intersect and cross in certain places that um, that are simply vortexes of uh, either electric or magnetic mm -hmm. energies or electromagnetic energies. Um, I mean, from from where I live here, where you and I live here in Western North Carolina, you know, down the road of Grand Grandfather Mountain is one of these ancient, you know, one of the most, we might say the most ancient mountain on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and certain vortexes of energy that's electro, electric or, or magnetic or both um, that simply exist in nature. Um, and and that, are, that are associated with ley lines and, and indigenous peoples have celebrated or done ceremonies these places forever. And then there's subtle energetic places that if you were to take a meandering walk through the woods and just open your senses you could find these places you know where the where a spring underneath the roots of a tree comes out or where where there's a certain threshold between two trees uh, and the trail passes through and as you walk through you feel you just didn't walk through two trees something shifted like they're all over the place yes and I think about the, uh, you know, we talk about medicine wheels or, or indigenous cosmologies that are directional, you know. So if we turn and, and face the rising sun in the east, it might uh, draw upon these feelings of spring and new beginnings and turning to the south and the warming suns and, and the season of summer, it will pull on certain energies in us and then turning the wheel to the west and, and foc focusing into the west and into autumn, into the harvest. This direction also pulls in or draws forth certain things with us. And then to the north, you know, into the, uh, we'd say the elders or, or that sovereign energy or the sacred mountain. And then of course the sky above and the earth below. And so there's a way of orienting ourselves directionally and accessing the medicine uh, that that lives in different directions and different sites. Mm -hmm. um, in the context of finding one's, uh, or I won't say finding, I'll say remembering. That's the way I think about it. Yes. In the context of remembering one's gift, one's uh, passion. Um, and the reason I say remembering is that in in all ancient cultures that I'm aware of. There was this understanding that we we come into this realm from the realm of our ancestors, and before coming here, it would be as if you and I look down here and say, "Oh, they they really need this particular gift or this particular medicine to help them at this time," and and I want to bring this. And then I would look around my ancestors and say, "And you and you and you and you also carry this medicine, and so I'll need your help when I get down there." And so we come here um, carrying uh, this precious medicine that's needed in the village. Um, so rites of passages and that involve sacred space, sacred site, uh, they're designed to activate the memory, uh, as the way I say it, to activate the memory of these agreements, mm -hmm. um, to awaken and activate uh, this alignment with your medicine, your gift. So in some, uh, so this idea of uh, going into nature and uh, creating uh, a sacred circle, a sacred space, um, and fasting and being in solitude, those three things, fasting, solitude, and exposure to the natural world, is the, the essence of a, of a rite of passage initiation. And so every, major religious tradition on the planet started with somebody doing that. You know, Jesus went down to the river and did a, a water ritual with a wild man named John, and then he went into the desert for 40 days and nights. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Buddha got a little, you know, discouraged with the state of things or before he was Buddha, and then Siddhartha left and, and went out under the Bodhi tree and spent time in nature. 
Uh, Muhammad went up on the mountain. Countless Native Americans have gone into the desert, into the plains, into the woodlands, and, and fasted and, and prayed and sought vision, um, sought to, to remember uh, this vision so that their people may live. That would be how it's said. Mm. Um, and so in this context uh, of connecting in solitude with sacred space and nature, and letting that experience activate something within the self or an awakening to something uh, bigger than we had thought of before. Um, and so to return from the sacred mountain is to, to say to come back with a story. You know, all of these major traditions, their, their teachings like Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad, they didn't begin their teachings until after they came back from this from this time in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we can visit sacred sites, it's a, a beautiful, very powerful thing. Um, however, not everyone's able to do that. And I, that's why I say find a way to, to go into nature, even if it's into a, a big park, um, and sit still and, and let uh, the sacred find you. It's like make yourself available so that spirit can find you. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is when the distractions of our mind start to slow down and settle down and our awareness starts to expand, um, it, it reminds me now of a, of a young man that uh, some years ago I was working with in a wilderness recovery center. <clears throat> and I went out and met him in the woods with his group. I think he'd been there only a few days. And um, I went out and, and I just we'll, we'll call him uh, Jim, Jimmy, and I said, "So, a uh, man's Jimmy. What's what's going on out here? What's happening?" And he looked up and he looked around and he said, "There's nothing happening out here." And he was just all frustrated and, you know, when can I get out of here? Well, about five weeks later, of course, he's now been in the woods for five weeks with his group and hiking, and and I went out and met him again, asked him the same question, and he looked up and he said there is so much happening out here, uh, just everywhere you look. And I could see that he had changed his relationship um, and that, that he had made him, well, I say made himself available so that the sacredness that's present could find him. Um, and so that's, you know, again, if we can't get to these beautiful sacred sites around the planet, um, Spirit will find you. You just have to make yourself available. Um, and so these quests, these we call it walkabouts in Australia, or vision quest is kind of the name that's been adopted here in this country, or, or um, hill walking in the British Isles. There's lots of names for this way of, of going out under the guidance of an elder um, and being prepared and then spending some time in the wilderness alone and fasting and listening and um, journaling maybe in this day and time and, um, and letting yourself be uh, activated or inspired uh, to come back with a story. So this, um, so sacred sites, uh, many of them serve the, the purpose of, of uh, activating something that, you, that we have forgotten. I think sacred sites around the planet do that in big ways. Um, the other day I was uh, uh, talking with a young man in Australia, like you and I are talking here, and we're talking about a particular ritual to go to do based on what he was telling me. I said, I want you to go into nature and spend the day in nature, and I want you to find a place in nature where the two worlds meet. And I'm telling him what that, you know, I don't know what that looks like for him, but... Uh, where the two worlds meet and you'll really you'll recognize it when you see it and when you get there uh, make some offerings speak some gratitude and uh, and I said contrary to what you might think sometimes these places are not always uh, places that feel great you know where the two worlds come together you know it might feel a little bit treachery it's like oh this looks like one of those places don't know that I would want to camp here but it feels very powerful <laughs> Um, so this uh, way of engaging uh, sacred space, you know, 
in, in these moments of time where we're in nature um, to, to inspire and activate, wake, wake up something in us that needs waking up. Yes, that, that uh, and, and remembering to pay attention to that. Um, sometimes I think those, um, those memories come back, that awakening is standing on the doorstep and, and we forget to pay attention to it. And, um, and I think that, that going to sacred sites or going out in nature, it, it's the intention. We go out with the intention. And if we are intentionally looking for that place where the two worlds meet, then we're likely to see it. Um, yeah, I think, and, and I think perhaps that more often than not, we unconsciously come upon those places and, and don't realize it. And so we walk by it. Um, yeah, more often than not, I think they see us. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Around or, or, or like not paying attention, being distracted by what's going on in our heads. Yes. And, uh, and, and they're, you know, waving their hands, thinking over here, over here. <laughs> Didn't miss it, um, and there's yeah, there's something uh, like the intention. What is my intention? What am I wishing to mark with this ceremony? Yeah. What is it that I'm going out to mark or to to put to this ceremony of of uh, of going into the natural world of, of sitting, even just to go out in nature and find a sit spot that you can hang out for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I always say spirit doesn't have a, it doesn't need a big chunk of time. You know, it's, if you get the opportunity to, to do a full quest where you're out uh, prepared to go out for four days and nights. Um, but you can do this in an hour mm -hmm. uh, just to go somewhere and sit and, and be still and pay attention for one hour and you will be surprised mm -hmm. um, to carry a question. Um, I would say to, to invoke the sacred um, so that you deliberately uh, speak an invocation uh, to the sacred uh, in that place. Um, whether it be, you know, a simple thing could be to go sit by a river and, and um, call on the spirit of the river to share something with you that you need to see at this time. It can be that broad and then you just sit and watch and listen and notice. Um, or you can carry a, a question um, and, and go to a place in nature with that question and say, you know, higher power, creator, God, goddess, uh, whatever, however I language the sacred, you know, I carry this question heavy on my heart and I've come here to sit and listen uh, and see what's offered. I think we you talked about you know activating the memory by going out in into the the woods. I remember I've, I've tried not to live in uh, deep in the city very often in my life. <laughs> I, my preference is to live in the woods, but I have lived in the city and and I remember as you were talking, I remember um, needing that connection to to nature. And not having a, a the time or the space to do that, and going out on my, I, I was in an apartment with a, a patio with you know walls between the very next one, and sat out there mm -hmm. and and even you know listened to the whatever the bugs that were around me, the birds that I could hear, um, and that's not nearly as as um, I guess enriching is going deep into the woods but but we don't have to go far to find that place to activate that memory right. Right. Yeah. It, can, it can uh yeah you don't have to live in you don't have to have access to the national forest like we do if you live in a city you can go to the park you can sit on a bench um it's a tune in your your senses to a, a, a deeper listening, a broader vision, um, to listen, you know, beneath the surface, to look beneath the surface, 
So what is being mirrored back? So mm -hmm. um, sacred space can, um, when I, uh, in, in, the, in our society, we often create sacred space with the beginning. We'll have some way of marking like, okay, well now we're gonna enter into sacred space. We'll ring a bell, we'll light some sage, we'll, we'll do something that says we're starting, we're stepping into sacred space. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's important in our society that we have a way of delineating uh, kind of consensus reality space and sacred space. Um, and so you could do anything, even if you lived in a city, if you did a threshold ceremony at the beginning of that day, maybe you created, lit a candle or, or created something in the room where you simply uh, said, today I'm gonna be in sacred space and pay attention as I walk with this question or this concern mm -hmm. and really watch and notice every encounter I have and then I step across this threshold or I step through this circle or I do something that says now I'm in. And so I move around my day really deeply watching. So I'm not in habitual ways of thinking and, and, and reacting to my environment. I'm in, a, I'm, in, I'm in sacred space, I've stepped into it. So you mark it with a, a threshold crossing. Um, and then you move about in that space, uh, whether you're in a city or whether you're um, you know, can go to a park or in the woods. And again, more deeply paying attention to the signs, to the, to the input, to the encounters, human or non-human, human or animal or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you will discover, if you do this enough, you'll discover that the sacred is alive all the time. Um, it's just, it's... Uh, by relationship and invitation and making ourselves available to it that we encounter it. Yes. Um, and so even if you did this for a few hours walking around your town and then came back and stepped through the threshold, okay, now I'm back and, and everyday time, um, and then journal about what you experienced. Um, it's the same principle as, as going on to the mountain for four days and nights. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very different uh, frequency of energy in nature than, say, in a city. Um, but spirit won't discriminate. It'll, it's willing to show up on a park bench as well as it is out in the wilderness by a waterfall. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, as I say, spirit, it's, spirit doesn't care if, uh, when you call, where you call from. Just call. Just call, <laughs> yeah. Well, speak for just a minute about... Um, um, not not just totem animals, but animals showing up and and our need to pay attention to those animals in our in our environment. I had a um, um, blue jay. Oh gosh, thousands of stories move through yeah. my head all of a sudden. Yeah, um, let's see what lands. You were going to say something about a blue jay. Well, I <laughs> yesterday I was outside, and um, I mean I have blue jays all around. That that's nothing new, but one flew into the creek right in front of me, and mm -hmm. uh, there were there were trees in between. I couldn't quite see it, but what I did see was it coming up out of the water, flying high up into a branch, and sitting there, and. Mm -hmm. This bird looked to me to be the size of these crows and ravens that are around here. Mm -hmm. Blue jays aren't usually quite that big. So mm -hmm. I paid, you know, it, it struck me as this is something I need to really look at today. And I did. I came in and really researched it and studied and, and read about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it really was very helpful to me. And so tell us. Talk to us a little bit about paying attention to those those animals that cross our paths. Yeah. So so if you have a if you set an intention and, and mark a threshold of stepping into sacred time and space, and then just be aware that everything you encounter has has medicine to offer you. Um, some of it will be poignant and and it's like whoa, how did that happen? Others will be more subtle. Um, just the other day, you know, as, as we're dealing with this, this virus and, and reaction to it and, and all of these, I decided I was going to do a one day 
and spent the day uh, meandering, just letting my intuition guide me to certain places. I'd sit and journal. And at one point I had gone down to this uh, uh, rise, uh, I guess up on a bluff uh, next to a river. And I was looking down at the river and I saw some deer crossing the river um, and starting up the hill to where I was. So I squatted down low and kind of turned my head to the side. So averted eye contact, thinking they're gonna come up over the bank. And if I can not frighten them, they might walk right by me. Um, and so I got low and, and they came up uh, and they actually came in right behind me because the land, the contours of the land were easier walking that way. So about 10 feet off to my left, uh, these deer and I could look out the corner of my eye and I could see and I counted one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the, the, the deer at the end, uh, as the rest of them had walked on, paused and stopped and turned its head and looked right at me. And I looked at the deer. And so we just held each other's gaze for a minute. And then it turned and followed the other, other deer away. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I encountered in that um, medicine walk that day, uh, as I was walking down the trail toward the river and I found this uh, bear skull been out there a while so it was bleached white mm -hmm. uh, but it was a the skull of a bear and so like you uh, I, I kind of looked into the teachings of bear and deer and uh, the question I had carried out into the into nature was uh, you know how to show up in these challenging times what is the what is the message of this difficult teacher that we call corona right now and um, and what came back dear is about compassion. Uh, compassion, self-compassion, compassion for others. Uh, bear is about uh, dreaming and, and grounding and connection to earth. Um, and uh, so these are these were teachings, this, these were, this was medicine that I drew from that walk from these encounters. Um, another, uh, I have so many that I'm just kind of filtering through which ones to to share. This was an interesting one. I was on my way to uh, my uncle's funeral. This was maybe 20 years ago. And uh, uh, I was traveling down to Savannah, Georgia, through these back roads, through the, through the uh, low country. It was very early morning. And I'm driving down this two-lane road and there are no other cars. And I can see way up in the distance, there's something on the side of the road. And as I'm getting closer and closer, um, I notice it's a great horned owl and it's maybe five feet off the road, just standing there. And I'm approaching it with the car and it doesn't move, it doesn't move. And I pass it and look to the side and it's standing there. And I look up in my rear view mirror and it's still there. And I thought, that's really odd. So I turned around and drove back and I passed it again. Then I turned around and came and I parked about 15 feet from it. And the owl's standing there on the side right now. I'm parked in front of it like this. So I get out of my car and I walk around. And then about five feet from the owl, I sit down. And now me and the owl are sitting together. Um, and the owl's looking back at me and I'm looking at this owl. And, uh, and then the little boy in me gets curious, I wonder how far an owl can turn its head. <laughs> so, uh, so I stood up and I started to walk a circle around the owl. And the owl started following me. You know, its body stood still and its head started to rotate. So when I got to the 180 degree mark behind the owl and its head had rotated all the way around, what was really amazing is, is how the owl lifted off the ground about a few inches and its body spun, not its head, <laughs> and it landed, and its head followed me the rest of the way around. Um, so that was, uh, again, that was an encounter on the way to my uncle's funeral. And, um, and so there are many teachings about uh, awareness, being able to see all, all sides, all viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of teachings I could draw from that experience. Um, yeah. And nature has a way of conspiring. Uh, when, when we go into nature, my experience of having done it so many times with people is that um, when we 
attune ourselves, when we quiet all the busyness and uh, angst that we often carry, uh, even that we don't know, but when our, when our systems settle down, uh, my, the way I talk, say it is that nature then can recognize us as one of its own. It's like all of a sudden we become, it's like, oh yeah, I can, I see you one of us now. And what happens is nature then begins to move in close. Animals start to show up. Um, I remember uh, we were, I was doing this ritual with this woman in the wilderness to prepare her to go out on the mountain for quest. And, and she had done this uh, work with dealing with this childhood trauma and, and violent household home around alcoholism and angry male father energy and and uh, she had done this, this work around being able to feel her strength and, and hold her center instead of getting terrified. And she goes out into, for her four days and night solo. And then when she comes back, she tells the story. She said, well, <clears throat> after I did all that ritual work about finding my center and holding my strength and standing in my strength as an adult woman, um, against the, the angry mask. And she said, I went out into, the, out into the wilderness and I found this beautiful spot. And then as the night came on, this great big male buck deer came into my space as if it was their space. And they wanted me to move because they started pawing the ground and snorting and walking towards me. And she said, but I decided I was not moving. <laughs> And so she and this great big horned male buck deer had this kind of standoff and the deer snorted and pawed the ground. Eventually it left. And I said, that is a beautiful story where nature uh, conspired with you in that old story. Um, so now the frightened little girl has this strong, wise adult woman to protect her. Mm, um, beautiful. I've, I've seen so many things like that in nature where it, it comes in um, and, and joins into the process mm -hmm. at a certain moment. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it can be very subtle. You can be sitting in your backyard and a bird flies up and, um, you know, all of a sudden uh, I've had a bird fly up and I was working with this man and it, and it chirped. Uh, three times in seven intervals like three times stop three times and mm -hmm. so I, I was listening to the bird while I was talking to this man and and I got oh 37 so I had this book beside me uh, that was a compilation of uh, poems for men called the rag and bone shop of the heart and I said hold on just a minute and I picked up the book I flipped to page 37 I read the man what it said and it landed and just just landed right into his story. Mm. Um, and uh, and a, a funny one, sitting like we were like here, I was doing a divination. Um, uh, so over here to my right, I have a couple of windows that I'm on the ground floor in my, in my medicine room. And so I'm doing this divination, cowrie shell divination with this person and I'm, I'm looking down at the divination spread and, and I have the computer screen turned down. I'm talking to the person because they're over in, in, in Europe and I'm looking at the bear claw on the divination spread. I said, you have this strong connection with bear. And, and I'm, I'm, and I'm going on and on about something about bear and their connection. And, and all of a sudden right to my side in this window right here, um, because we live in Asheville, <laughs> yeah. this great big bear comes walking up to my window and I'm like, how, how is this? And I turned my computer and said like that. There, there. <laughs> you know, you, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but often it's much more subtle. You know, these are pretty dramatic ones, but uh, yeah. often they're very subtle. Well, like the bird the stories, <laughs> the stories that, um, that, because I know you are a storyteller, those stories activate our memory as well. They activate sometimes a memory of an event in the woods, mm -hmm. but also on that pathway to activating our memory of, of our purpose here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a teaching I learned from a, a wonderful story anthropologist, uh, Angelus Arium. Many of you have probably heard of her. Um, 
uh, and I received a teaching from her one time when, when we were talking about stories or she was sharing about stories. <clears throat> and I would, I would uh, paraphrase it this way or my understanding, this was I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, but um, the way I would say the stories are living and breathing entities. They're not fixed constructs of meaning that uh, are meant to be just mean one thing. That's how we get trapped in a story. Um, like the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves based on our understanding of our own history can trap us um, and we get stuck in that story. Uh, or the way that we do that to other people, we'll have a story about them that traps them in that perception and they can't be anything else but the story we trap them in for us. Mm -hmm. Um, but they say stories are meant to be living and breathing entities that change. And, and uh, I love the teaching where she shared that, you know, that the place where you first enter a story, um, even if the story has been going on a couple of minutes, but something happens and you're in the, the storyteller says something that catches your attention, reaches out, and pulls you into the story at that moment. Said so that place right there, some, whatever was happening in the story, that's an important place. Uh, another place in stories is that place in the story where your attention stops, maybe down at the river or, or with the bear or with the owl, um, but you, your attention stops there and the story keeps going. The story goes on along the trail and like that trail behind me down the path, but you didn't follow it. You stayed right there with that bear or that owl and, and that's because there's something, it's not important that you stayed with the story. It's like there's something right here in the story that has something to offer you. Um, and then the other place in the story is, is that place where something happens in the story and you leave that story and you don't hear anything else the storyteller said, and you go off in your own story and something happens out there um, that was connected to this part in the story here. So these are what we call the, the threshold places of stories that have the most medicine to offer. So in, in, in ancient times, a medicine story could be told over and over and over in, in that one place where you entered for the first time or you stopped or you left and went somewhere. Like these places are the sacred space. If we're talking about sacred sites, these are the sacred sites of a, of a story that capture you. Um, and, and you can hear a, a medicine story over and over and that, that place will move around, you know, it'll be a different place in the story mm -hmm. another time. Um, and the reason it captures you is, is like you were alluding to it, it it's wanting to wake up something in you or, or remind you of something that has been left behind mm -hmm. or something you need for the journey. And, and the reason that is because the point is not that you understand the story, that is that you be in relationship to it and let it be in relationship with you. And that's the similar thing I was saying about sacred sites. It's not about the place solely. Mm -hmm. um, it's about your relationship to it and, and how you uh, bring your attention to it, your present moment awareness to it so that the sacred uh, can then find you. You know, to, to approach the sacred with reverence allows the sacred to approach you with a similar reverence. Um, and, and then you notice each other at somewhere down that road. Yeah. Yeah, so, so finding our, um, our soul's purpose is really just waking up so that we can remember who we are and remember why we're here. Yeah, and think of um, soul's purpose. Um, uh, we have this tendency in, in our in our um, in our society and in, in this uh, human centric and ego centric thinking when we talk about soulmate, as if there's this one person that's just meant for my self gratification, <laughs> or soul's purpose, as if there's this compartmentalized here it is. Um, but these things are activated at different levels throughout our development. So what, get, what gets activated in you at 14 that is connected to your, that is like an ingredient of your soul's purpose, mm -hmm. may get activated again at 28 and get activated again at 40 or 50 or 60. And, and these activations 
is where we get more of awakening uh, to that uh, or fine tuning of a particular delivery system of our of our medicine gift or soul's purpose as we call it. Mm. So it's not like it always just comes in one neat package at one time. Um, as as you know, as far as that have lived long enough now, it's like oh, we well, should work that way. Um, but there are activations along the way. Yeah. Um, that that uh, uh, you know, I always say to people, you know, do you know more now than you did five years ago? Especially with young people, and they say, oh, absolutely. I said, well, every five years is like that. Hopefully, is that every every five years you'll look back and say, five years ago. You know, I, I, I can see so much more now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then when you get old enough, you, it, it ends you to say, it's like the older I get, the less I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, really true. Because I think, I think perhaps because we open up to understand that there's so much more than we are. And, yeah. and maybe that's why we understand that we really don't know very much at all. Yeah, it, and it's it becomes less about what we know. It, it becomes more it is uh, I don't know if it was Joseph Campbell that that coined the phrase or who, whoever it was, but it, it's less about figuring out the meaning of our life, and and then it becomes more about the experience of simply being alive. Yes. And so we 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 go from seeking meaning for life, which again, as if meaning were some kind of fixed construct that's going to stay solid throughout our life eventually we get old enough the meaning is like trying to hold water in your hands it's not it's not a solid meaning changes yeah Uh, but if we seek the experience of being alive that's where the edge is that's where creativity lives that's where inspiration lives is 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 what is it uh what is that experience of being alive and so when when people come back with a story from nature or they do a particular ritual that I may have guided them to do, or they've done on their own, or even if they bring a dream to me, uh, um, I say, be careful not to ask the question, what does this mean? That's our, our, our Western psychological thinking. I'd say, ask the question in light of my experience, in light of my dream, in light of my encounter in the wilderness, in light of my walk in the park, in light of what I experienced, what actions am I guided to take? And mm-hmm. so this, we, we narrow the gap between uh, what we experience and, and, and fill all that up with lots of meaning as if it's going to stay steady and it won't. <laughs> but we narrow that gap between what we notice and the actions we take, not out of impulsivity, mm-hmm. but out of awareness like, in light of my encounter with Bear, with, with Al, with uh, the person at the grocery store that, that really stood out to me, mm-hmm. what action does that guide me to take in my life today? Now, here's the thing. When we ask the question, don't let it be, what action am I guided to take with my life? You can get really, mm-hmm. it becomes too vague. <laughs> what action am I guided to take when I get home with my children tonight? Okay. What action am I guided to take, you know, this week at work? Uh, what action am I guided to take in my own self-care uh, today? So you bring it in close. I, I love that David White poem called Start Close In. Uh, I don't have it memorized, but it's certainly worth looking up for those of you that are listening to this. Um, he says, start close in, not with the third thing or the second thing, but with the first thing. The thing close in, the thing you don't want to start with. <laughs> start close in. Start um, close in by David White. Yes, yes, beautiful poem. But it's about, uh, you know, it, it's about that which we need to pay attention to is already paying attention to us. It's close in. Uh-huh. Um, that's why I say, don't ask the question, what action am I guided to take with my life? No, get way close in. What action am I guided to take tonight when I get home, Mm -hmm. this morning when I wake up, before I start into my day? The closer in you get it, uh, the more uh, sacred the encounter will be. Um, 
the further out it goes, the, the more vague and, and lost it can become. Not that it could be a great thing. And you might have a grand goal and vision. Those are important. But, mm -hmm. but those encounters that are close in, I think that, that's where uh, when we talk about sacred site, sacred place. It's like bringing it close in is what opens the doorway to the encounter that makes this place sacred. Mm. Um, yeah. Is bringing it close enough. Wow, it's so very, very true. Wow, it's it's just amazing. It's been amazing to have you here and and listen to you talk about uh, about the our sacred journeys and our sacred places. Um, I I know that you have a gift that you want to offer, and um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about the gift, but but explain to us what it's about. So I guess it's a kind of a double gift. One is if you if you go to our website, which is rightsofpassagecouncil.org, um, or even my website, because they both connect to the same place. Mine is caterbrown.com. Mm -hmm. And you sign up for the newsletter. Um, you'll get an automatic download uh, of a story called Singing Stone. It's, uh, it's an audio version of me telling a drumming story. Um, I think you've heard the story before, Peggy. I have. Yeah. Um, of singing stone, it's a it's a story of the initiatory passage or sacred journey, um, and then um, once you do that, um, you'll be enter your name will be entered into a drawing for a free divination, um, and so if people register, I usually go in a couple of days before your um, summit begins. And then anybody that registers within that time period and a few days after. And within that time period, I will just look at all the people that registered for the newsletter during that time and just randomly pick a, pick a name. Um, I usually pick a number in my head and I just go count until I get to that number. And then I email that person. And um, so they you know, want a free cowrie shell divination. And if you would like to learn about what a cowrie shell divination is, you can go to my website, caterbrown.com, and uh, spelled K-E-D-A-R, Brown. And um, click on the Retreats button, and you'll see uh, uh, divinations, and it says Learn More, and you can click and learn more there about that process. Yes, and I'll... I promise I'll bear will go up at my window while we do it, but... <laughs> <laughs> But it might happen. <laughs> yeah, I'll put both, both of those websites on the uh, on the page uh, when I introduce you with it, so people can get okay. those as well. So yeah, there'll be a there'll be a link to to get to it. Yes. Well, thank you so very much. This has just been delightful to spend this time with you today. Yes. Thank you, Peggy. It's been fun. <laughs>